Hello, my name is Prasanna Balachandran and I'm from the University of Virginia. Today, I want to discuss about how data-driven techniques that are built on the foundations of machine learning and optimal learning have enabled us to accelerate the search and discovery of new materials. In this presentation, I've identified two specific problem statements where we believe the data-driven methods are particularly useful. So this is the first statement. When we have a really vast and complex search space, and this is one of the cases where we have seen these machine learning methods to have an enormous impact. And one of the important characteristics of such problems is that only a tiny fraction of the materials has been experimentally investigated. As a result, we have a vast space of materials combination that has not been investigated at all. And our main interest is in rapidly exploring this, this potentially new space in order to find new materials that perform better than what has been known so far. And in order for these artificial intelligence approach to be useful for such problems, the nature of the search space should also be such that the current state-of-the-art high throughput experimental as well as computational approaches should not be feasible. And I would also like to note that a vast majority of material science problems typically fall under this problem statement. In the second problem statement, we first assume that the search space is not as vast as in the previous case, but the problem is complex enough that we cannot run experiments or simulations to thoroughly investigate the space. This is generally the case when the experiments or calculations are time consuming or expensive. Here, it is crucial to pick the optimal candidates by optimally surveying the search space so that the resources are better utilized. This is another scenario where we have demonstrated the potential of AI tools for accelerated discovery. Okay. So having defined the problems in this context, uh, it also introduces important challenges in our data-driven approach that must be addressed in order to produce meaningful outcomes. First, we must develop a strategy that should enable us to learn from small data. Keep in mind the first problem statement, right? Even though we have a really vast search space, only a tiny fraction has been experimentally observed. As a result, we have a small training set to train our machine learning models and a vast space of potential candidates for performing predictive studies. In fact, these are some of the examples from our own published papers that show the relative sizes of the training as well as the virtual spaces, right? So if you look at the different problems here, it's easy to see that, you know, we typically have a really tiny fraction available for which the responses or the properties that we care about is known, but then there is a huge amount of unexplored materials for which we would like to know or predict the properties reliably, right? So, so these are some of the illustrative cases uh, that I've picked. And in fact, there are many examples in the literature that can be coded to, to you know, that satisfy this particular criteria. Here are the challenges, you know, when, when we deal with small data and we are trying to learn from small data. Number one, when the task is to learn from small data, uncertainty, uncertainty quantification becomes a crucial component. Without being able to quantify uncertainties, it will be difficult for us to objectively assess the reliability of our trained models across the entire search space that we are interested in. Another important ingredient uh, that we will have to deal with when, uh, when we are essentially looking into small data is, is that where possible, it is encouraged to incorporate physics or domain knowledge into the training set. This is one of the places where we have seen the potential of physics-based computational tools to be valuable in order to inform the learning task. And finally, it is also desired to have an iterative learning scheme where we sequentially improve the model performance. Thus, the models will have the capacity to rapidly learn the response surface and reliably guide the experiments or calculations towards the promising regions in the design space, right? So in addition to the uncertainties that are inherent from the small data, since one of our interests is to look into data coming from experiments, it also adds an additional level of complexity to the problem, where 
Uh, in addition to the inherent uncertainties, we also have to grapple with uncertainties originating from, for instance, the measured uh, experimental data sources. Since one of the main methods for us to actually collate the training data is by surveying the published literature, heterogeneity is another important factor that we will have to deal with, which introduces another level of uncertainty into our, into our problem. And the key point that I wanted to convey here is that our data-driven strategy should account for all these uncertainties as well in order to produce meaningful outcome. Considering these challenges, uh, we have developed a novel approach, uh, which is shown here. And our formalism, in fact, has four independent components associated with it. And I'm gonna walk you through every single component first before introducing to a couple of case studies where these components have been actually tested and new materials have been discovered. All right. The first important aspect is the database. In my opinion, uh, database is the place where the problem is defined. This is, again, one of the places where some of the important input descriptors and the key target properties are identified. So uh, this also provides us a way to combine for instance, information or insights that we believe is critical from theory and simulations as well, right? So once a meaningful data set is constructed that is reflective of the problem of interest, then the next step is to, is to, is to take this data and, and start building machine learning models. And, and one of the advantages for these machine learning models is that it allows us to establish a quantitative relationship between the input descriptors and the target property of interest. One of the key ingredient of the machine learning model should be such that it, it must allow us to quantify prediction uncertainties. And at this stage, uh, we have employed both off the shelf methods as well as more informed Bayesian methods to actually help us build this structure property relationships. Once the model is built, then the next step will be to use it and predict the properties of the unexplored materials in the vast search space. At this stage, as you can imagine, we will face a completely new conundrum. Imagine that we will now have predictions for thousands or potentially millions of candidates. And from this vast pool of candidates, the key question is the following. Which new set of data points or new materials should be picked for running our next experiment or simulation? I think this is where this concept of optimal learning becomes crucial that can help us to make informed decisions about where should we actually go in our next set of uh, uh, simulations or experiments. And at this point, uh, I would like to emphasize that the, there are several utility functions that are available to us in order to help us make, an, make, make these decisions. And, and, and some of the most commonly employed utility functions are uh, uncertainty, uncertainty sampling, uh, exploiting the model outcome, uh, efficient global optimization, uh, knowledge gradient, and mean objective cost of uncertainty, to name a few. So what these utility function allows us to do is that it, it, will, it will consider both the predicted value from your machine learning models, as well as the uncertainties. And depending on the flavor of this utility function, it will also allow us to evaluate a trade-off between uh, uh, you know, the predicted value as well as the uncertainties associated with those predictions. These utility functions, uh, in turn, will rank each unexplored material in the vast space that satisfy a specific criterion. And the top ranked materials will then be recommended for validation and feedback. And finally, we have this step called as Oracle, uh, which is either the experiment or computation, which will allow us to validate the predictions and provide feedback for model improvement. And once we have the target properties characterized, then uh, the new data point will augment our training data, and then we will iterate this entire process until the design objectives are accomplished. Right. So this is the strategy that, that we have developed in the past, and, and we have seen its potential to, to help us with Chill's design and discovery. As noted earlier, uh, we did apply this strategy for a number of problems, and I'm listing uh, a small subset of papers where, uh, that have, where, where these strategies are in fact uh, discussed and, and where we have demonstrated that new materials can in turn be discovered. And for the sake of this presentation, 
I, I, I'm going to focus on uh, these two interesting case studies to motivate the discussion further. All right, the first problem. So in the first case study, uh, this is one of the first problems where uh, we actually demonstrated the entire uh, uh, adaptive design loop that, that was just discussed a few minutes ago. And, and we did uncover some interesting insights, uh, which I wanted to share with you. Right. So, so without getting into the specific material science question, let me define the problem from the context of machine learning and optimal learning and walk you through the steps that we followed in order to accomplish the task. Right. So the main challenge is the following. So, so we were interested in discovering a, shape, a new shape memory alloy in the five component space that I've shown here uh, that will have the smallest thermal hysteresis. And and, and, and keeping in line with the discussion that we had uh, uh, in the previous slides. So we had to start our exercise with only 22 data points to train a model. And our back of the envelope calculations indicated that there are approximately 800,000 possible compositions for which the delta T is not known. And the best material in our training data set had a, a delta T, which is the thermal hysteresis here of about 3.15 Kelvin. And the key question to machine learning and optimal learning was the following. Are there new alloy compositions with delta T smaller than 3.15 Kelvin in this 800,000 possible space? And can we use these methods to rapidly discover those alloys? Right? So, so this was the question that we motivated for this problem. Right? So uh, in fact, this is another uh, uh, rendition of the informatics strategy that I showed before. Uh, that was used to specifically address this problem. And, and this contains the database component, the machine learning component. The optimal learning is referred to as design here. And the Oracle in this particular case was experiment. And, and we did have an iterative loop to, to provide or augment our training data with, with new data from experiments. And in fact, in this particular problem, uh, we, iterated you know, we, we iterated exactly nine times uh, to help us really understand about this novel adaptive learning scheme. Let me jump right into the results. Uh, so we predicted, synthesized, and characterized 36 new alloys in this particular process. Each iteration, we were able to make four new alloys. So we found that there were 14 new alloys with delta T smaller than 3.15 Kelvin, which was the best in our training set. And the best alloy, whose composition is listed here, had a delta T of 1.84 Kelvin. Right? So this shows that our strategy in fact works and we can in fact identify or, or predict in this case, discover new alloys with properties better than what we started. But intriguingly, one of the interesting things that we found in this exercise was that this new alloy was discovered not, not at the first iterative step, right? As noted in this table below, this new alloy actually came into existence during only the sixth iteration of our, of our adaptive design exercise. And we believe that this has to deal with the way the optimal learning method had allowed us to survey the search space starting from the small training data. And this was an illustrative exercise for us to, to, to learn about how this process in fact works and how this can indeed lead to new materials with properties better than what we actually started. Right? This was one of the important case studies uh, uh, you know, where we really demonstrated the potential of this approach for accelerated design and discovery of new materials. Another important problem, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm moving on to my second case study here in, in material science, is being able to recommend new materials that can be synthesized in the laboratory. All right. So in, a, in, in the previous example, in fact, we exerted a lot of domain knowledge and we were able to, in fact, constrain our chemical and compositional space uh, uh, such that we know that every alloy, every alloy in this 800,000 uh, uh, possible space can be, in fact, synthesized using arc melting. However, most problems in material science do not offer that luxury. You know, in this second example, I'll discuss another case study where we were able to demonstrate the application of uh, these machine learning methods to, to recommend new materials with targeted properties that are also potentially formable in the desired crystal structure that we were interested in in, 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 in this particular question. And the problem statement is in fact defined here. 
So we, uh, as shown in this, in this triangle, we were interested in a pseudo ternary phase diagram. And our goal was to identify uh, uh, the chemistry that can go into this ME prime, ME double prime, and also the exact composition X and Y, such that the final ceramic is a solid solution that will have the desired perovskite crystal structure. And the crystal structure is also schematically shown here. In addition, the perovskite should also have a very high ferroelectric Curie temperature, right? So, so we were able to go back to the literature and build a training data set for this problem, where in addition to collecting properties, in, in addition to, where in addition to collecting data on the property of interest here, which is the Curie temperature, we should also capture data on whether this particular composition had in fact resulted in a perovskite crystal structure or not. So, so in fact, you know, since this material has been, has been under research for, for at least four to five decades, uh, we were able to compile approximately 167 compositions uh, from surveying the published, published literature. And, and one of the intriguing aspects about, about this data collection process is that we were able to include experimental data from both successful and failed experiments, right? More specifically, a failed experiment here would denote that this specific stoichiometric uh, composition uh, either had secondary phases with, with substantial phase fraction or did not even result in a perovskite crystal structure. So this was necessary because in the future, we were much more interested in, in letting our machine learning models learn from failure and avoid recommending new materials that would not have a perovskite crystal structure. Right. So in addition, we were also able to go back and, and do this enumeration of potential possibilities. And we ended up listing approximately 61,000 compositions for which both the formability data does not exist as well as the property data, which is the Curie temperature does not exist. And the key question here is the following. Are there new high temperature ferroelectric perovskites in this unexplored space? And can we use machine learning type of methods to, to rapidly navigate this space and identify new materials? And for this problem, we devised a new strategy, which we refer to as the uh, a, a two-step approach uh, to, to accelerate discovery. The first step here uh, would involve uh, an independent machine learning model, a classification learning model here, that will allow us to screen for compositions that are formable in the perovskite crystal structure. The second step will perform a second level screening uh, where uh, we will identify optimal perovskites that will have that will have a high ferroelectric Curie temperature. And, and finally, in this case, we used experiments to actually validate our, our predictions. And we resorted to a commonly used ceramic processing route that did not require high pressure or high, temp high temperature synthesis here. So, so, so the output from uh, an experiment will allow us to update both the formability data as well as the regression, uh, as well as the uh, the, the data required for regression analysis, which is uh, the data on ferroelectric uh, Curie temperature. Right. So, so this is the, so I, I'm summarizing the, the results in the slide. So, uh, so the key points are the following. So in total, uh, we were able to perform 10 experiments in this, in this particular exercise in five iterations. And it turned out that six out of the 10 compositions that we predicted had the desired perovskite crystal structure. And some of the compositions even had a, a high ferroelectric Curie temperature of approximately 900 Kelvin. And one of, the, one, one of the intriguing aspects about this particular uh, work, uh, which excited us as well as the, uh, the, the ferroelectric uh, or the high temperature ferroelectric community is that we were able to identify the new combinations of ME prime and ME double prime, such as you know, a, a perovskite lattice that contains iron and cobalt and, and cobalt and aluminum for that matter, which we were also able to show that it can, it can be stabilized in the perovskite crystal structure uh, and have a high ferroelectric Curie temperature. Thus, using this approach, we were able to, uh, uh, to expand the knowledge base of high temperature ferroelectric ceramics, uh, especially those with perovskite crystal structure. So in summary, uh, I've shown the impact of machine learning methods in, in accelerating new materials discovery. Key to such discoveries, in my opinion, are, are co-design uh, that involves 
synergy between data experiments, computations, and simulations. And I would also like to know that this paradigm is still in its infancy, and there are a number of problems that need to be addressed, including multi-objective optimization, the need to deal with multimodality, uh, heterogeneous data sets, uh, the problem of uncertainty quantification is, is still prevalent, uh, uh, and, and the need to develop mechanistic understanding and causal relationships, and finally, the need to consider uh, multiple length scales and time scales. And I want to thank you for your attention and also the MRS for giving this opportunity to share these ideas with you. All right, thank you, Dr. Balachandra, uh, for the wonderful talk. I'm also pleased to say that Dr. Balachandra is here on the line, so we'll be, I'll be reading your questions for him and uh, some followers from the previous talk. Uh, one that I'm very excited to hear uh, talked about is a uh, discussion of a common opinion of ML, which is, is that it is bad for extrapolation, but does a great job of interpolation. Uh, what is your take on this? Um, is there a way that we can use extrapolation uh, or, you know, to help us learn new physics or, or discover new materials? So, hi, Matt. This is a great question. Uh, and I would tend to agree with your assessment and the common opinion that uh, ML, if used by itself, is, is actually bad for extrapolation. And, and in fact, there are demonstrated uh, uh, examples that, that show this behavior, you know, which is the reason why we strongly believe that ML alone uh, can be suboptimal for, uh, for accelerated materials discovery. On the other hand, if we can augment the ML approach with uncertainty quantification and these utility function, in other words, uh, optimal learning, then there's a potential for us to actually get out of this local minima, which is where the ML models are typically, which is where the ML models typically reside, and, and help us potentially explore the search space, which is where the chance for discovering new materials with properties better than what we already have can, can potentially happen. You know, as you can see in the examples that, that I talked about, uh, at least in the shape memory alloy case, we were able to, uh, to in fact get out of that local minima and then essentially, you know, help navigate the space uh, and find, in fact, new compositions with properties better than what we started. So, and your question about new physics is also very well taken. Uh, at, at, you know, I think it's a very difficult uh, question to answer using the data that I've actually presented in these slides. Uh, but I tend to agree with you that uh, uh, out of the exercise that, that we did so far, uh, you know, we haven't really unraveled uh, uh, any new physics, uh, you know, which would indeed require follow-up experiments and, and perhaps few other simulations. So, uh, so that's where I would like to stop uh, answering this question. <laughs> um, excellent. And I, I, your, your emphasis of uncertainty quantification is certainly well received, and I hope that a lot of people on the line take that, uh, take that very seriously. <laughs> um, as, a, uh, as another question, um, has your discovery of new materials focused on experimental validation or validation by simulation? Uh, and as a follow-on, do you see opportunities for large computing power to be applied uh, to explore these kinds of property spaces of materials? All right. Uh, thank you, Keith, for the question. Uh, so, in the, in the in the two case studies that I that I discussed in this in this presentation, uh, you know, we had the luxury of performing experimental validation to to help us build better models and actually understand uh, the structure property relationship here. So, uh, in fact, there are a lot of other papers uh, uh, out there in the literature where uh, where we have also used uh, you know computational simulations. Uh, you know, ranging from, uh, you know, density functional theory to more commercial codes uh, to help us with the validation process. So uh, that's exactly how, uh, you know, I see this, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that's one of the, uh, well, well, the point that I'm trying to make is that we have, you know, we have both, exper you know, one can in principle use experiments or computations depending on the nature of, pro of the problem that we are trying to solve. And, and, and to follow up with your question on HPCs, I think there is a significant potential of, of adapting these approaches, uh, you know, in order to perform meaningful exploration of search, search spaces using computational methods, leveraging the HPC resources. I think, uh, you know, that's one of my, uh, my, my interests, and, uh, you know, I, I hope to leverage these resources and, and in turn apply these methods to, to help us understand uh, or uncover uh, new understanding of materials properties. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Oregon State University, uh, which is, how do you go about choosing the material system for a machine learning study? Uh, and so do certain materials lend themselves better to machine learning than, than others? 
Uh, and uh, this actually follows on the, the question that uh, I posed to Carla at the end of the last session. Um, it, you know, and this came up because, you know, people have done a lot in different kinds of ceramics and metals and, and 2D materials, but uh, less in some other fields such as biomaterials. And so uh, back to you, you know, how do you go about choosing a material system to study? <laughs> Uh, this is a difficult question to answer uh, because of the fact that it's uh, it's based on uh, you know I would say once once domain expertise and uh, and and you know whether you have a team that can actually work together to to solve an interesting problem that you have so uh, so in the cases that I demonstrated uh, you know we had a fairly good idea of uh, uh, you know of, of how these ferroelectric oxides work and. And, and how the shape memory alloys actually work. And then, you know, we were able to embark on uh, on problems and we were able to identify some specific questions. So so the real answer is to actually, uh, you know, work closely with the domain expert and, and, and try to learn as much as from the domain expert as possible. And, and also try to leverage as much as, as much of uh, input from the domain expert into your learning scheme. In, in my opinion, the training data set and all the constraints that come with building your machine learning models. So, so I, that is where I generally believe, uh, you know, how I would go ahead and pick my, my material system. I see, so I'm glad you brought up domain experts because I think um, an excellent part of what you, you spoke about uh, was the way you bring domain expertise in. And so can you just maybe comment a little more about how you can have domain expertise continually be a part of an automated framework? Uh, how that can, you know, not just be sort of something that happens at the beginning, but something that happens continuously throughout? That's a good question, in fact. And uh, I think this is where we go beyond, you know, AI and, and have this you know, human computer type of interaction at play here. Uh, 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 you know, uh, and, and uh, you, you know, I, uh, what I can actually talk to uh, is, is where we have been uh, uh, you know, fortunate enough to to bring in this domain expertise. In, you know, in the ferroelectric oxide example that I talked about, uh, you know, there is a there is a rich there is a rich history of of what aspects of material, you know, what aspects of this crystal structure, in fact, contribute to uh, to, to to the to the ferroelectric Curie temperature and uh, and and from X-ray diffraction studies and from you know density functional theory studies, it, it was well known that the, the essentially the displacement of an ion uh, from its ideal site was considered to be a really important descriptor uh, for us to actually model or or establish this relationship with the Curie temperature. So so we were able to in fact leverage this understanding, uh, uh, you know, which was collected and which was essentially. Uh, continued by by the researchers, and we were able to bring that important key descriptor into our into our system, and 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 use it to further uh, 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 you know to further help us with the search of new materials with better properties. So uh, so that, so I believe that is one place where you know we were able to bring in domain knowledge at the beginning, uh, uh, you know which which was you know which which in fact helped us to reduce the dimensionality of our problem to a, to a really tiny fraction so that we can still leverage these, these small data tools to help us build meaningful relationships. So that is, you know, I believe that in part addresses the, uh, one of the questions. So the second question was, you know, how do we, you know, in, in, this, in this aspect of autonomy, how do we adaptively build in domain expertise? And I have, I have an interesting experience to share with there. Uh, you know, which I did not talk in this in this presentation. So this was another problem, uh, you know, which we were interested in in predicting, uh, uh, you know, for another ferroelectric oxide. In this case, a barium titanate based ferroelectric oxide, and we were excited about about predicting a new dopant, uh, which we thought is going to improve, for instance, the Curie temperature of this barium titanate based uh, uh, based ferroelectric oxides. However, experiments showed us that our predictions were completely wrong, and and. And you know, and and we were initially surprised. We did some follow-up experiments to actually uh, 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 to go back and and you know re reconsider our hypothesis because we had you know meaningful descriptors from ab initio calculations to guide the machine learning process. But then at some point in time, uh, I had a conversation with the domain expert uh, who said that you know in the systems that you are looking at. Uh, in addition to these atomistic features, microstructural features are equally important to actually capture the trend that you're trying to explain. For instance, he said that grain size is a key enabler 
for tuning these properties. And and then it dawned on me that we never considered grain size as a descriptor for our problem. So I think this is exactly you know as you you know uh, as you as you as you perform these studies as you continuously fail uh, you know in, in your prediction and validation. I, I think that is where you have to you know start reconsidering your hypotheses and then you know go talk to other domain experts and and see if there are other descriptors that could potentially help us capture this crucial relationship. You know which can help us with the accelerated discovery. That's a really phenomenal point to bring up. I think the. Uh, you know, we heard earlier that processing kind of snuck in as a new, as a, you know, something that needs to be considered and, and microstructure, of course. So I think, um, you know, the size of the domain that you have to consider might be considerably larger than you want it to be. Uh, exactly in, in, right. And, so. and, and in, in our original formalism, you know, we, 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 you know, we just waved our hand and said that perhaps it's not an important factor. But, but it turned out, you know, we needed that factor to be, to be accurate in our predictions. <laughs> So that, that leads us to a, perhaps the last question, uh, just to, to maybe get a brief thought, which is, you know, when you're considering a material system, do you think about it in terms of, you know, how big should the search space be, or how do you, I mean, you mentioned dimensionality reduction, the idea of, you know, narrowing down parameter space in some meaningful way, uh, but, you know, how do you, how do you start? How do you know it's big enough to start with? How do you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, maybe just a, a quick thought for the, for the listeners. I see. That's that's another excellent question. So, uh, you know, I like these questions because it goes back to the hypothesis generation as opposed to building these machine learning models and, and enabling AI. So, uh, yeah, you know, but but to go back to this to this specific question, uh, uh, I would say that uh, you know before we start on a problem, I think it's good to good to take a step back and really understand what has actually happened, uh, you know, in the literature considering this particular problem and. Uh, uh, you know, can we can we actually come up with a meaningful hypothesis to to begin this exploratory and 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 this 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 fascinating journey of uh, of materials exploration in, in search of better properties and uh, and can those hypotheses be translated into a, a data set? That's the next question. Are there quantitative descriptors that we can in fact uh, incorporate in our data set, which can help us to translate the hypothesis that we have been we have been formulating, and and the data set should also be reflective of both, you know, uh, the training set as well as the virtual set. So this puts severe constraints on how do we even construct these descriptors. And finally, uh, you know, the the size of your data will dictate the strategy that you would want to adapt. You know, so uh, you know, especially if you're expanding the the search space by including almost all the elements from the periodic table, uh, then it becomes certain that. Uh, your training set is extremely restrictive of the physics that is actually trying to convey. Uh, then the problem of iterative learning becomes an important factor, and the problem of incorporating uncertainty becomes much more crucial. So, uh, so it's, it's essentially you know an ensemble of aspects must be considered, uh, you know, before we can go back and say, hey, this is the strategy that I have that can potentially help me uh, go and discover this this, in, this exciting new search space. Uh, which in turn can enable us to study some interesting new properties of the material. I, I hope, uh, I, I hope this answers the question that you asked. Definitely, and I think I think one one thing to, to especially highlight is you know you you mentioned that building hypotheses is a really important part of the process, and uh, I mean it's very um, you know as far as every materials researcher in the in the, the chat and here builds hypotheses as part of their living. So that's exactly uh, right. wonderful to know that that um, you know that's sort of an equally important part of this. So. Uh, but thank you, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Dr. Balachandran, for your for the wonderful talk in the Q and A.